Hi, I'm Allison Buckenterrell. I'm a producer at The Agenda with Steve Pakin. This week, TVO, in partnership with the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, is presenting Mental Health Matters. This is an in-depth exploration of the state of mental health in our society, and we at The Agenda are devoting a week's worth of our programming on air and online to mental health. As part of that series, I'm joined now by Jeff Pavir. He is a film columnist at the Globe and Mail, and he's here to talk to me a little bit about mental health and popular culture. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure, Allison. So let's get right down to it, and let's talk about the connection between film and mental health. Well, I mean, it's an interesting connection because basically, you know, if you see, if you understand that, that, that you know, the birth of movies really represents sort of the birth of popular culture, visual popular culture as we now understand it, it's moving pictures, it's television, it's a lot of what we do on the internet, all that starts with movies. Movies start really around the same time, for example, that psychoanalysis does. So movies and visual culture have a strong, strong connection with our public awareness of uh, mental disorder, um, certain kinds of affliction, uh, and I, it's not a coincidence, for example, that Sigmund Freud himself was fascinated by movies because he thought that movies represented probably the closest approximation to the dream experience we could have while waking. So essentially, yeah, movies and and our awareness of mental disorder, the public public sensitivity to mental disorders, really it really um, uh, proceeds along parallel paths, pretty much at the same time. So given that we're going so far back historically, there must have been an evolution in how we're portraying characters from the beginning of sort of cinema until now in film and television. Can you talk a little bit about how that has evolved? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, essentially, uh, if you understand, you know, I mean, film begins in the in the 1890s. And so there is very much still a strong Victorian Gothic idea of insanity. And uh, if you think, for example, of movies like one of the most influential films of the silent era was a movie called, you know, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And it was t it took place uh, in an asylum. But what it did was, I mean, that movie uh, established a sort of a, a visual language for madness, as it was called. And that was, you know, very sharply distorted perspectives, uh, the experience of people who were under some kind of uh, uh, foreign control and suggestion. And so I, I do think that that was very much a strong part of the early representation of mental illness. But it changes a lot really in the 1940s and the 1950s, because at that point in time, I think the huge influx of, of, of men returning to from war, uh, and they didn't have the word post-traumatic stress at the time, but they understood that there was a very, very, very kind of seriously debilitating effect that this experience had had. That is where I think you begin to see a very interesting change in the depiction of mental disorder. That's followed by television. Television is about the home. We watch it in the home and, for the, and begins slowly to acknowledge the fact that no one really can live in this world who is aware and not know someone or not be related to someone or themselves not be suffering from some kind of mental disorder. And I think what we've seen is that this gradual process through popular culture paralleling, uh, uh, I think, our general sensitivity to what, what is going on with people who are suffering from mental disorders. That's fascinating. So you're saying that it very much is reflective of where society is at in terms of our views of mental health and mental illness. Oh, very much. And of course, and it becomes a very kind of interesting, you know, kind of chicken or egg argument, you know, does, does popular culture in a way kind of like uh, uh, tow our perception behind it or is popular culture towed by our changing perceptions? Uh, I think the answer is not simple and I think it goes both ways. I do think, for instance, you know, it's kind of interesting to look back, you know, if you look back at the, uh, you know, in the, in the 40s and the 50s, for example, um, you first started to see psychiatrists and psychiatry and analysis appear in movies for the first time, right? But usually it was used in terms of suspense. And often, you know, the idea was that anyone who was suffering from a kind of a mental disorder was under the influence of something sinister, under the influence of something evil. Uh, and I do think that this had an awful lot to do with all the crime movies, the film noir of the 40s and 50s, really could, wouldn't have existed if it weren't for the fact that so many men were now back in society and society was aware of the fact that these guys had undergone experiences that had changed them, that had changed the relationship with society that might have made them dangerous and threatening. Then what happens in the 1960s is with television, you start to see more and more characters. You see a more benign, um, I think, uh, uh, characterization of, of, of psychiatry, the process of psychoanalysis. Uh, it becomes a huge subject of, of comedy, for example, 
example, Woody Allen wouldn't exist without psychoanalysis as a subject of, of, of comedy. And then... It, it, and then it becomes sort of increasingly through through television, uh, I think especially again in the 1970s, what you start to see is a more sensitive portrait, but also I think a greater acknowledgement that there are that people actually do function in society uh, and that they are not to be uh, uh, marginalized. Uh, to be villainized or to be made afraid of that they actually are people who live in society, function in society, and if we really want to admit it, uh, a, a lot of us are in fact suffering from various degrees of mental disorder. Well, and I guess let's get down to, you mentioned a few different examples there, but do you have any favorite, um, I guess I shouldn't say favorite, but what are some of the best maybe positive portrayals, um, best characters that you've seen in film or television? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, is it, um, it, it, it depends, of course, sort of what you look at. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, for example, you know, psychotic villains who are great characters. Does this represent it in, in any way an accurate depiction? No, I don't, I don't think it really does. I do think that there have been some kind of, you know, there, there were important um, characters. You know, if you look, for example, at the character played by, you know, Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, I think that was a, a, a an important film, maybe not a great film, and, a, and one that was, a, I think, drew an awful lot of, uh, of of negative attention in terms of the accuracy of its depiction. Um, but I do think that, 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 again, in the 1970s, as I was saying, well, you, you began to see movies that dealt with dis disorders as a form of domestic crisis. They dealt with sort of disorders within the family and how the family dealt with it. I think, for example, if you just look at the past, you know, couple of years alone, what you see are some of the most remarkable examples of the sort of, I would guess I call, the, you know, the mainstream accommodation of, of mental disorder into society. If you look at the character of Carrie Matheson as, you met, as in Homeland, that's a very, very interesting character. She is suffering from a, a, a bipolar disorder, um, but it is something which is... Although it is part of the drama, there's no question about it, you know, and the, part of the suspense has to do with the fact that this woman who is a guardian of national secrets, can this affliction somehow threaten that or, or, or make that somehow more dramatic? Yet it also shows the challenges that she has dealing with it, the fact that she does deal with it, and we accept it as part of her condition, uh, and we don't make a judgment on her for it. And I do think, for example, if you look at the success of a movie like Silver Linings Playbook, that's a very, very benign and accepting, I think, portrayal of mental disorder as something that people live with and something that people accept uh, within themselves but need to be accepted for and I think for all those reasons you know um, uh, what 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 uh, uh, what we what we have basically seen is a much greater form of cultural acceptance of this as you know we used to call it abnormality now I think it, it, we understand it as part of the fabric of normality now you mentioned Homeland which I must confess is one of my very favorite shows right now sure. And um, I shared it with you via email when we were sort of setting up this interview, and, and it was an article in the New York Times written by, I believe it's a sister of one of the main writers of Homeland. Yes. And, and it kind of speaks to what these portrayals of these characters mean, and I'm wondering if maybe you can tell us a bit, a bit more about um, the significance of, of seeing um, these characters for people who are living themselves with mental illnesses. Well, I think it's. I think it has. It has an enormous impact, um, and it has an enormously uh, positive impact. Um, I think we often kind of, you know, underestimate um, the significance that sort of popular culture representations of various groups and experience can have. And this is why, for example, there is always uh, uh, someone out there who's going, "No, that doesn't represent my experience. I feel excluded." And I understand that. But I do think that that you know the the the, the piece that you you referred to was was extremely touching because yes it was written by by a woman who, who suffers from bipolar disorder who is a sister of a writer for Homeland and who says that the character of Carrie Matheson when she watches it is it represents the very first time she feels that her condition has been accurately portrayed on on television I think I think that I think that you know the fact that 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 kind of um, uh, care would be taken uh, not only that the that the depiction is accurate but that the depiction is thorough that it what it says is, is, is not basically that this woman is a hero for dealing with this, but the fact that she can function even though she has this, uh, and that it's constant presence in her life. I would also say that one of the real significant developments in, 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 in Homeland uh, is not one of the shows that touches on this, but a great many shows have in the last 20 years, is the depiction of 
of addiction. I mean, that's something. I mean, it's it's hard now not to think of a television show for you know which which can't somehow mention a twelve step program after five or six episodes. That is now so common that almost every television program has someone who is dealing with recovery, needs to get into recovery, or is dealing with addictive issues, uh, and is, is seeking some kind of therapy. And again, what I think what what for for people who have been dealing with that to see their experience. I mean, it used to be that. If you felt you went to a 12-step program, if you felt you needed a psychiatrist, if you felt you needed medication to uh, moderate your kind of your behavior or your perception, that was a huge cultural secret. It was not something anybody talked about. And that's even rooted back to the earlier image of, you know, if you had someone who was quote-unquote crazy in your family, you know, you locked them up or you kept them upstairs in the attic. All this kind of stuff was very much considered dark and secretive. Now it's right out there. It may not be accurately depicted all the time when it's out there, but the fact that it is out there makes it part of the larger discussion, puts it in more in the context of normal kind of behavior, opens it up for either criticism or praise, and permits the kind of discussion in the New York Times of bipolar disorder that you and I just talked about. I guess getting back to you mentioned accuracy, and I'm just wondering, does accuracy matter? Does it matter to whether it's positive, what effect it has, or is that just something that a clinician can watch something and know, well, it's not 100% true, but it still serves an important purpose? Well, that's, I mean, it's a, that's a very interesting question, and it's one that is asked of popular culture all the time, you know, and, uh, you know, our, our, do, do, are cop shows realistic? Were westerns realistic, for example? Um, and I think it's I think the question of accuracy is an important one, but the question of accuracy doesn't completely deal with I think with the with the function of popular culture. The function of popular culture is largely to pr provide us with a kind of a diversion. It provides us with a kind of idealized image. We turn to it because it provides certain things in a kind of an, an artificial or virtual fashion that we don't get in real life. That's why we're attracted to it. So I think that what the tension that goes on in popular culture, Allison, is a tension between providing us with something that is an accurate depiction but also something that is a satisfying depiction. And I think that even if you are, for example, belong to, uh, even if you are suffering from a, mess, uh, a, a form of mental disorder, or you have a form of mental disorder, and you're looking for representation, I think that in a way you're not just looking for accurate representation. You are to a large extent, but you're also looking for positive representation. And positive representation and accurate representation aren't always the same thing. And I think that this is one of the things that it keeps the debate going. But the most important thing, as I said, is that the debate is now out there in a way that I think probably even, you know, 40, 50 years ago, it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been having this discussion. Now, we talked a little bit about um, positive portrayals, and I guess to be fair and just quickly touch on the other side of the coin, um, what are some of the issues? I'm assuming we haven't fully come to a place where everything is great and everybody's doing a great job of portraying these kinds of characters. Is there anybody that is worthy of maybe a bit of a, a head shake or a wag of a finger? Well, I think I mean I, you know what we what we we have a a, a long way um, to go. I think you know um, especially in terms of I mean the, one of the reasons why Homeland is such an is such an interesting breakthrough is is here is a character who is suffering from a sort of a clinically accurate disorder who is the central character in a television program. Whether or not that will lead to, for example, more programs like that. And I don't know if it will because Homeland is, is, isn't just great because it has that character in it. It's also great because the writing is great. The plotting is great. It's got, it's got great television creative characteristics behind it. So it's not just a question of putting those characters out there. It's a question of putting them out there in the context of programs that stand up, I think, as, as good and worthy and sturdy programs. So I would like to see sort of more characters that, that deal with that. I would be interested. I mean, we, 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 as I said, we've seen all kinds of characters <clears throat> Excuse me, who are dealing with forms of addiction and recovery, um, I would like to see, I think it would be very interesting to see a sort of a television program that deals with the character who is dealing with recovery, experiencing multiple relapses, is going through the process of trying to hide their addiction, and yet are, they're, they're functioning. I mean, this would be very, very interesting. I think, you know, there, there was a very interesting movie that was released last year with Denzel Washington called Flight. That sort of character, that was very interesting. He was an alcoholic who was in heavy, heavy, heavy denial until the point that he realized that his he, he could no longer bear his lives, and he even gave up his livelihood in order to, to admit it. That would be very interesting to see. That would be the next step. And I also think that, you know, one of the, one of, one of the, one of the final frontiers of sensitivity, <laughs> and I think you understand this, 
this is in the depiction of psychopathology. Now, it's hard to get behind psychopathic characters and say, no, we need to be more fair. <laughs> but the fact is, psychopathology is another pathology which afflicts very many people who do function in society uh, and their disability does not necessarily mean that they are Hannibal Lecter. Uh, they function in society and I do think that you know the more that we are aware that these are things that operate within society that as I say aren't abnormal but actually comprise the entire fabric of, fabric of what we call normality, we will consider, you know, we will continue to, to I think, probably uh, move forward. Now, this is actually one of those discussions of representation in popular culture, which is actually pretty, it is pretty positive on the whole, you know. Progress has been made, we can pinpoint to progress that has been made, uh, and I think that, it, as I, you know, I've said a couple of times, the very fact we're having this discussion in this way indicates just how far we've come. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but let's say that we had to pick sort of maybe a top five, and it can be a, a mix of movies and, and television shows, but what would you say is your top five kind of mental health, pop culture, films, TV shows? Oh boy! You know, I would say that you know one of the one of the one of the very best uh, films about addiction and alcoholism uh, remains *The Lost Weekend*, that was made in 1946, I think. Um, it, it's it's an app. It's it's a still harrowing depiction of life from the inside of that addiction. I would say you know, moving ahead a number of years, if you look at something like what was a very popular movie, *To Kill a Mockingbird*, uh, the character who was played by Robert Duvall, the Boo Radley character living next door was first portrayed as a very frightening character but someone who becomes a friend of the um, um, of the young girl who is narrating the story so he she becomes accept he becomes accepted into her world in, 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 in a story which is also about I think you know prejudice and racism that becomes a very powerful metaphor uh, and I would say you know coming up you know more recently I'm, I'm so struck by the character of Carrie Matheson in Homeland which we have talked about that, that kind of eclipses a lot of other a lot of other characters in, in, in the sheer um, um, progress that it indicates and I would also say that you know to, to pick another recent film which has been which is which has been um, uh, one that moved me very much was Flight with Denzel Washington. So that's a that's just an off the top of my uh, my own rather uh, troubled dome that I came. I arrived at those titles. Well, I'm really glad that we got the plug in for Homeland because I think everybody should watch it. So absolutely, I wanted, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time today, Jeff. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Allison. Any time. And I just wanted to let everybody know that if you want to see all of our mental health matters coverage, go to the Agenda website, which is theagenda.tvo.org. We have a special mental health matters page where you can see all of the programs, our blogs, and online content, such as hangouts like these. So I am Allison Buckenterrell. Thank you so much for joining us.